This week I'm joined by David Webb, who is a professor of philosophy at Staffordshire University, specialising in contemporary European philosophy, French epistemology and philosophy of science. He has published two books, Foucault's Archaeology, Science and Transformation, and Heidegger, Ethics and the Practice of Ontology. In this episode we discuss Michel Serre's text, The Birth of Physics. I'd like to say a big thank you to all my patrons for making all this work possible. And if you'd like to support Hermetics Podcast or become part of the Hermetics community, please find our Patreon, Discord, donation and merchandise links in the description below. Enjoy. So, David Webb, uh, welcome back onto Hermetics Podcast. Thank you very much. It's lovely to, to be back and thank you for, thank you for having us. Right. Uh, to talk about um, the, the birth of physics, which we dipped into very sort of briefly and I think we both sort of realised when we did a, a episode which I think was about 90 minutes on you know you to have an episode titled The Philosophy of Michel Say you know, that's tough for any philosopher but when you've got someone like Say I quickly realised which is why I sort of started this series was there is there <laughs> even describing one of his books in, in under an hour is really difficult so you know now we're back for the uh, the Michel Say project Going to so you're the translator of the birth of physics along with Bill Ross who I've interviewed. Yes. Um, Bill sort of spoke about how this book came around, so I'm going to jump straight in with the philosophy. And there, there is a question that unfortunately I didn't put on the questions I sent you, um, and it, it comes along quite early on. Um, and Sarah is talking about Lucretius's text uh, De, De Rerum Natura, and why do you think it is that Michel Say reaches so far back to Lucretius, and and he often reaches so far back. You know, he's always using the Greeks. Is there? Does he ever mention any clear reasons for this? Interesting question. Um, my first thought is that it's for for Sarah, it's not so much a question of reaching far back, and for that <laughs> we have to already understand something about how he uh, views time and history. Uh, but if we do not think of time and history as entirely linear, then then uh, Lucretius is not so very far back, uh, not so very far away from us. And in fact, one of the things that emerges from, from Sayre's thought is that um, different points in in time and history, as, as we perceive them in a more orthodox way, uh, sort of stretched out along a, along a, long, a long line, uh, are actually kind of, folded up in, in some different ways. Uh, the, the image of the crumpled handkerchief is the one that he uses a few times. Uh, so that what appears to be, from one perspective, two points that are separated by a long distance, in fact, are very these, those two points are very proximate. So in a way, for him, I think um, Lucretius is our contemporary. So reaching back is not such a... I, I wouldn't see him reaching back so much as just he just reads... Uh, everywhere <laughs> and everything and uh, there's nothing which is really nothing would make say I think well I need a justification for 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 reading this or for going further back or for taking an additional step or for reading beyond that disciplinary boundary to think about a different scientific or philosophical or literary um, approach there's no reason that he needs to do it uh, because these things all, com all communicate and uh, and through the reading that he does he discovers that some are actually far more uh, proximate to one another than perhaps we we realized initially uh, th th so I, th I think that's how i'd see it so he doesn't actually need <laughs> need an explanation in a way <laughs> he just reads and then uh, establishes these connections between things which um, sometimes turn out to be much closer than we expect um, perhaps perhaps that was a trick question to, uh, to bring <laughs> back in the uh, the temporality again as soon as, as soon as things are nonlinear and that's accepted as your foundation you mm. you, in, you just run into so many problems regarding basically every form of classical you know philosophical question that you, you have to start again um, pretty much um, yeah. So for for the birth of physics, um, I imagine you you've explained this so many times. But there there is um, a system within the birth of physics which I said to, to Bill Ross. That's quite rare for Sarah. He didn't agree with me. He countered this and pushed back against it and said actually there is systems there, but they're not formed in the same way as say 
Deleuze has his three synthesis, or Kant has mm. uh, Phenomena Numena, and everything's very structured, or Heidegger has uh, ontical and ontological, and everything's, you know, sort of placed and structured against each other as some form of action-reaction. But Serre doesn't construct his systems in this way. But this is one in sort of a rare occurrence, perhaps there's huge Deleuzean gaps in my knowledge, but there is a clear system here uh, re with regarding, well, regarding atomism. Could you possibly give us an overview of this system and, and what you... And, and whether or not you'd agree that, or how you think Sess sees the idea of philosophical structures of the system. Okay. Um, first of all, just uh, I, I would, I would kind of agree with with Bill on this, although it is a it is a difficult one. Um, certainly, uh, the, you don't find a a, a simple declaration of a of a structure or system in Sess thinking, which is then kind of repeated. Uh, that's kind of quite foreign to the to the way that he, he thinks and writes. Uh, but there are, yeah, you can identify certain motifs or refrains or, or um, I won't say themes so much as variations because he does a, at one point say, um, even, even if you think about the musical format of a theme and variations, uh, he he would prefer to say that even, even the theme is a variation. There's no reason to privilege one moment of this uh, over over another, so that we do see patterns in his thinking. Um, this is something I think actually just to, uh, to to open up a parenthesis for a moment that uh, Chris Watkin has uh, explained very nicely in his in his uh, new book, we shall say, it's figures of thought, where he, he tries to understand a little bit about, tries to explain a little bit about what how Sarah thinks, and I think he. he he does that very well there. Um, so I think there are sort of patterns we can identify. Yeah, and and I think you're you're right to say that in in the book of physics we find a relatively clear, <laughs> relatively clear statement uh, of this. I think that the pattern is established quite strongly, should we say, uh, here in the birth of physics. And while it would be wrong to use the birth of physics as simply as a, a key, shall we say, to reading everything else. Uh, it does provide a helpful kind of point of reference, I think. Um, now, for reading uh, other other works by, by Sarah, uh, having, having said that, uh, he that the birth of physics presents, if you like, one way into doing this. And, and uh, although I do think that it's a particularly helpful or clear way of thinking about some of the, uh, the problems that he addresses and how he done, how he addresses them, there would be others. And, and you could begin elsewhere in his work and and develop a reading of his work out of out of uh, other works, other texts that he's written as well, which would be then a slightly different uh, presentation or reading of his work as a whole. Uh, but to come to the birth, the birth of physics, the um, we have to begin, I think, with with what Lucretius was um, himself was presenting to us. In um, Lucretius was writing in the first century BC, uh, and he he wrote this book De Rerum Natura, uh, which is usually translated as on the nature of things, sometimes as on the nature of the universe, and it's a presentation or telling in verse of uh, Epicurean philosophy. And uh, the key points for Sayer are that uh, how Lucretius presents the emergence of order. This is the whole thing, really. How does order emerge? And what we learn from, from reading Lucretius is that uh, there is no absolute beginning in the sense of a kind of a big bang moment or moment of creation in the universe not at all but there is a kind of initial state when all the atoms in the universe and the universe is infinite all the atoms in the universe just rain down in parallel lines but this kind of perfectly uniform movement in effect is no movement at all because everything is is nothing happens it's, it's a completely uniform and effectively inert state until such time as there is a completely spontaneous uncaused deviation of one atom from a path from its parallel path and 
Of course, that then causes it to collide with other atoms. And then um, from that, more collisions occur, atoms are bashed off their paths, and uh, there's turbulence and a, a kind of chaotic state. And then from that turbulence, uh, patterns begin to emerge as atoms combine following their collisions. And uh, as the atoms combine, uh, so patterns of regularity emerge, and we see we see regular movement, and or, uh, which Lucretius and Serre identify as, as vortices, as whirls, like whirlpools in the, in the water. And uh, here we then have patterns of order, patterns of repetition, and these are the beginning of stable order of different kinds. Okay, so um, that's the 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 kind of pattern that very briefly and there's lots in there that we could unpick and talk about a bit further but that, that's briefly the uh the, the the idea of the emergence of order that lucretius describes and that's key for very much very much for the whole of the birth of physics but michel said but also for i think for other works of his as well because we we have in that story we have the idea that um let's just pick out a couple of key kind of elements of what happens there for say first of all there's no absolute beginning there's no first cause or first principle that we could go back to to say okay here is the origin of all things there is no uh there is no reason therefore that we can go back to to say there is a justification or an explanation for the beginning of all things because that first deviation of the atom, the clinamen, uh, was spontaneous, uncaused. And um, we also have a pattern emerges where uh, there is order in the world, but it's entirely local. So there's, the universe is infinite, but there are different forms of order scattered across the universe. And um, these are local patterns of order which follow their own local regularities and, in effect, therefore, their own local rules. And so there's, there's no possibility of a universal, a simply universal science or explanation of all things. And that, too, is, is um, really important for, uh, for Sarah. And just to, 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 to round off this <laughs> very quick indication of what's going on there, you asked about says understanding of, of uh, structure i i'm not sure if this will adequately uh, answer your question but you can i think you can take that last point i made and see how it works there in a in a, in a, a broader sense because if lucretius is saying that there is there are different worlds scattered across the universe each of them ordered in different ways because they've emerged locally and in fact in lucretius's text itself different kind of levels of order emerge in this world from the, from the material world through to the living world, the social world, and so on. Each, again, a little different, but organised in line with the same basic principles. Uh, we can see that for Sarah, there is no basic fundamental structure, which we can go back to and go, okay, this is it. This is how things, this is how everything works. And, and, it's impossible to then say oh, we'll take this structure and we'll we'll use that as a simple imprint that we can expect to find iterated, reiterated everywhere as a key to understanding all things. Because each instance, whether we're talking about um, we're not we're not going to be talking about moving to different worlds in the way that Lucretius might have imagined, but certainly as, as if we move from different uh, philosophical or scientific or social scientific disciplines, and we move from thinking about physics to thinking about history, for example, then they follow their own rules. There are connections. The order has emerged in the same kind of way, but each time in a unique way. And so uh, we can find a way to move from one to another, but we have to find that way, and we can't assume we know it in advance simply by having figured out the structure in one place and expecting to find it somewhere else. Um, so that leads then into the way in which he thinks about reading and communication and so on, because we actually have to uh, work our way, if you like, from one uh, discipline or problem um, through to another. There's, there's, as, as, as I see it, there's sort of a slight little paradox there, because he's 
You know, there's this idea that there's no overarching system. I think Bill Ross said, you know, for say nothing is privileged. You can't, yeah. you can't take uh, anything, can't box something else and off and say, right, this is just biology or this is, this is yeah. just, this is just, I don't know, art or something like that. You can't do that. So really, Lucretius's system. Can we say that this is, you know, that you have this underlying system, but it itself is like a non-system because it doesn't. It's a system of non-privilege, right? So mm-hmm. it doesn't have anything. It's really difficult to think about the the Lucretian form of physics because you know, I think from a human point of view we always have like directions we always have you know vectors that we want to go in this is to explain the uh, the Klinemann is sort of impossible I mean how how in, yes does does Sir see the Klinemann in, in different forms at certain points certainly you can't explain it and <laughs> and that is absolutely fundamental <clears throat> um, because if you could explain it there would be a reason for all things. Mm-hmm. And and if there was a reason for all things, then you could then you could uh, uh, gradually build up something like a kind of universal system, uh, which he really does not think is possible at all. And so, and it's the, the Klinemann that kind of holds that space open in a way. Um, we can't explain it; it it just happens. It's entirely contingent. Um, and and I'm sorry, I've forgotten the second part of the question, which was the, how. Um, there's sort of a paradox because it's it's sort of a non it's a non system, you know. Yes. There is a there is a what you call a system there because it moves from what it goes from the Klinemann to turbulence to a temporary flux to uh, yeah. yeah vortices and vortexes. So like there is a system, but the I think I guess what is essential is that the or there is there is no originary point. There's no beginning which has a it's con- it's entirely random. That would be the yes uh, the the. The point about that, and I think the interesting thing about that, is that there is no origin, there is no final explanation for things, there is no final reason for things, but that doesn't mean that there are no reasons, no explanations, uh, there's no order, uh, because all of these things emerge from the processes. And so that's that's how we arrive at the idea that there are, if you like, uh, local explanations, reasons, chains of cause and effect to a point um, that we can uh, uh, that we can identify and understand, but uh, no way to go back to some first radical principle which will encompass everything. No, uh, that's that's certainly impossible for him. Okay, so while while we're on the subject, because I think it would be quite difficult to get back to it with regards to Lucretius and the fact that Sayre takes so much inspiration and influence from from Lucretius in general and from this system. Um, yeah. In, in, in a certain way, can we consider Sarah an, uh, an Epicurean? Uh, so that's, uh, that's, that's a good one. Um, up, to a, <coughs> excuse me, up to a point, yeah. I think we can up to a point. And, and the, this is the problem with trying to pin Sarah down anywhere, is that uh, we could identify him as an Epicurean, but we could also identify him as a Leibnizian, as a, uh, as a, as a, uh, we could even perhaps up to a point as a Comtean. Um, there are many different ways in which you could identify him, and it goes back to a little bit to what I was saying at the beginning. Uh, this book is a kind of way into reading Sarah, and I think if you take this book very strongly as as, as your guide, uh, then you will you will kind of see Sarah looking quite like an Epicurean. But it's not the only way to read Sir, and it'd be, it would be difficult to, or wrong, I think, in the end, to reduce him to that. Um, for example, there are uh, there are traces, you could say, of, of an Epicurean ethics in his writing, but he doesn't simply reproduce an ethic, Epicurean ethics because his work is also a reading of so many other things, which are also working through his texts and working through his ideas at the same time. So there's no, again, we must always be careful, I think, in reading says to to to, uh, to kind of make, make it too easy for ourselves in a way by saying, OK, I've got it. I know he's really a Lucretian or a Leibnizian or an Epicurean, and that kind of explains everything. Um, it will help a lot, probably, but it won't explain everything because <laughs> there are too many, uh, too many things happening, too many influences, too many, too many variations going on. And in the end, that 
reading of Sayre will be one variation among others. Uh, his, his kind of proximity to Lucretius and through Lucretius to Epicurus uh, is, yeah, that's one um, that's one kind of model, if you like. That's one affiliation that he has, but it's it's not the only one. So, yeah, can't go too far that way. Do you do you think that this this form of atomism, the Cretan atomism, uh, utilizes in this text? Yeah. Do you think that it it is different to? Um, I mean, it doesn't really have a name now, but you, I guess you'd call it kind of extreme deconstruction, where people say things like, "Well, love doesn't matter because it's just a it's just a." It's just a formation of atoms and chemicals, etc. Does mm. you know, and in that, I think is any ability because Sir is an extremely moral and ethical philosopher. Yeah, um, in that would be the. I, I think there must be a difference there because Sir does does manage to retain mm -hmm. uh, um, an ethics. And how how do you think he does does that in in the face of this in in the face of this um, atomistic reality? Well, I think the first thing to 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 see there is that the uh, for him re, re, thinking about atomism and de de describing the ideas that he finds there in, in in Lucretius, and and saying in the end that first of all there is nothing nothing but atoms and void, and that then all all order begins to emerge from their combinations, from the combinations of atoms, and hence we arrive at worlds and at material order and at life and at social life and human beings and all kinds. Um, that this is not a reductionistic story in the end. So, uh, and there's, there's one reason, there's lots of, well, there's more than one reason for this, but one reason for this is that uh, it would be a reductionistic story if we could say from the beginning that we understand and we know the laws by which atoms move and combine. Right? If we could do that, then we could say, all right, well, um, so atoms crash around in the void, there's turbulence, and then they form combinations. Uh, but actually, all of the time, atoms are only moving according to already fixed laws that we either know or can know. Uh, if that were the case, then every other form of order or thinking that follows would simply be, um, could simply be reduced to physical laws. It would be a, be a very, the possibility of a kind of, physicalism or scientism or reductionism fundamentally is is there but that's not the case for him um just to explain that mm -hmm. briefly the atoms crash around in the void for, Lu for lucretius and and so describes this very carefully to say okay well but as that's happening they begin to form combinations but it's only when those combinations settle into a regular pattern of order that we can say that laws emerge so you have first of all something like cause and effect because one atom bashes into another and something happens but you don't that, that cause and effect is not law governed in the way that we think of it in modern physics where law comes first and, and then all movement is governed by that uh, so the laws emerge as laws emerge locally and uh, that means that you can't reduce one set of phenomena which are over here in, in a Lucretian sense in this world, should we say, to what's happening in another world. Or we can't reduce the patterns of order that we find in, in social life uh, and, and morals, for example, as Lucretius talks about. And we can't simply reduce them to, uh, to physics, to the movement of atoms. And I think that is really, really crucial for say, so that. We can think of love, say, and that's a really, really important term for uh, for Sarah. And it would be madness in his view to think that it was kind of meaningless in some way because it was really just all about atoms crashing around. Yeah, mm -hmm. because it, that would explain nothing. It would explain absolutely nothing, and it could explain nothing because the patterns of order in 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 the in the case of love and our experience of love and how how love happens actually uh, owe nothing to the laws of to what's happening when atoms actually crash around by themselves right they, the levels of explanation the levels of order are quite different right? 
one emerges from the other, but it's not reducible back. And love, actually, he's when he in writing um, the birth of physics, which, which is a kind of commentary on Lucretius's uh, De Rerum Natura, uh, the figure of Venus, god of love, is really important in in, in uh, De Rerum Natura in Lucretius's text. And for uh, for Sayre too, so we have uh, the sense in which the atoms combine. Well, this is love. Right? Why? Why not? Why is this not? A, why do we not think about the, these kind of conjunctions and combinations and connections in terms of uh, in terms of love? Why is love only something that happens between two human beings, for example, and and not something that we could speak about between happening between uh, two atoms. Um, so the way what that does is completely kind of destabilize a little bit that kind of sense of we know where the fundamental discourse is and then we can try and draw conclusions from that about other other kinds of uh, phenomena or other kinds of discourse. Everything has to be taken in its own terms um, and no particular one is privileged. So we might learn something about human love by looking at atoms, but we don't actually learn how it works. We actually, in the end, all we do is kind of enrich our story by uh, extending it, by embracing more possible variations, shall we say. The idea that one, as soon as one begins, if, if one was to begin this process of saying you take love and you begin to really look at it, the more and more you realise that it's not privileged and it's part of this system of uh, like a multiplicity of communication where there's different levels they're all interacting in different ways this yeah. complexity and complexification is actually what enriches any form of, of deconstruction and do you think do you think that that's where yeah. and how he does manage to retain you know, forms of humanity with you know within this sort of tumult of uh, physics and, and entropy and impermanence yeah yeah, yeah. Sorry. I, yeah, I, yes, I think so. I, I think that's a, a a large part of it. I mean, I think there's a certain kind of temperamental disposition in his thinking, which probably counts. Uh, but if you're really just focusing on the kind of how that thinking works uh, on the page, so to speak, then then yes, because um, we are part of a vast complex order of things and uh, we have our part in it and actually no part is fundamentally privileged over any other and so we um, there's no reason to think that we, we should discount or, or, or sort of demean in any way our experience or the language we use to speak of it um, just because it's not rigorous enough or not materialistic enough or not physical not not, not not enough like physics or something um because that would that would be to um as i say to, to obviously to privilege certain discourses and certain approaches and certain languages over others uh there's a there's a um some wonderful lines in the birth of physics if we could just refer to these it might explain this a little bit um where he talks about how things emerge bearing their own code right because everything is uh, a kind of formation of order of some kind right? and uh, the point for him is that we don't understand these things by assuming in advance that we that we we have the right key the right structure the right uh, model or whatever which we can bring to these things to understand but rather uh, if everything is bears its own code as he says or if we could use the language of sort of information theory if you like to speak about this and say it has its own kind of information embedded into it that um each thing then is understood best from itself right uh, there's a um so he writes take here we go take a thing in your hands anything at all from the earth from the water a stone or an animal read read this object from the world read it as it was written in the letters of its atoms 
written in its crystalline depths and in its full smooth molecules which roll against each other is how this thing was born, is how it was made part of nature. It is the written memory of its formation, of its emergence from the chaos. The thing is the fabric of its genesis. It speaks of itself as formed by fall and by chance, by cataract and by inclination, by vortices and by interlacing. And here is the woven text. Right. Now, that's rather beautiful lines, I think, which which kind of indicate how we kind of understand things best, taking each as their own model in a way, right? Rather than by bringing a model to them. And that's there's that would include human human relations and and ethics and love uh, and so on as well. We're not we don't best understand these things by reducing them to something else. Right? Uh, we take these things and read them, read in them, the, uh, the, uh, the codes or the patterns of their own formation. So Sir would say that if one wants to understand a rock, then they need to need to look at the rock itself, but, it, but you could also understand the cosmos. But he, at the same time, the problem here is that he, he never wants to cordon off these things, right? So he's saying that it, here, here is this thing, understand it by, by its atoms, by its own structure, by its sort of locality. But at yeah. the same time, his philosophy is uh, most certainly one of communication, and and I I imagine he would say that you can't, you still can't understand the rock without understanding the way in which it communicates with its uh, its surroundings and its environment and yeah. the way in which it's communicated with. So, at what point for Sarah can one yeah. begin to say, well, okay, well, well now we need to, and um, and, for, and what use is there, I guess, for Sarah? Maybe use is the wrong word because that's once again a sort of human centered idea. But, you know, when can we move and say, OK, well, now we need to understand this from a different angle. You know, when mm. when do we move away from the locality towards a either a network or, mm. uh, um, I guess, a global or a, a mm. cosmic idea? No, that's a good, good question. And it points out that I was in pointing out this aspect of what uh, Sarah is uh, saying or probably under underplayed other important aspects which you've you highlighted there in terms of communication <laughs> relations the um if uh just to go back to that passage to kind of read some of those thoughts back into what i just read out of the the text which incidentally if anyone's looking for it, it comes on page 204 of um of uh, the birth of physics he he writes there says they take a thing in your hands anything at all from the earth etc read this object from the world written in its crystalline depths, crystalline depths and in its full molecules, is how it was made part of nature. It is the written memory of its formation, of its emergence from the chaos. Read its atom letters. Read the body's sentence. Uh, but the sentence of the body, so to speak, what is then written into that body, is its relations in the end. Right? Uh, it only, it doesn't have any... Uh, any kind of intrinsic, essential, original sense or meaning other than it's the path of its formation in the end. Right? And so uh, rather than going back to some notion of a kind of metaphysical substance where we could say, okay, this is what we're really trying to read in things, uh, we can, like, if, we, if we read hard enough and carefully enough we'll identify the essential attributes of what this thing is in itself what we read is its history in effect right we read the history of its relations with, with other things um, the history of its formation and the history of its formation deformation reformation or whatever it may be there's a um, there's a just to, to step out of this book for a moment and into another one in the um, i'm reminded of how in the uh, in his book, the five senses, he talks about the skin there bearing, bearing the marks uh, of every relation I've had of everything that has happened to this to this body is kind of marked on its skin somehow, and uh, that's yeah, that's that's how he thinks, and that's the kind of that's the Leibnizian in him that that things are their relations with others, yes, and within this. There is, you know, when you're looking at the relations for Ser, there's something, and it, it still astounds me, and I, I think I remember mentioning this in our last discussion, but it still astounds me, is 
whenever you look at the relations of something, for Sarah, there is always um, not so much an emphasis, but an acknowledgement of impermanence. And yeah. this is something that Bill Ross brought up, which is the way in which Sarah reads this. And now when I think about it, it is actually quite easy to connect this to his ethical thought. It's the idea that, you know, you can even think about it as something as simple as a rock, which is understanding that the the within the chaos of the world, the entire chance of something so small and so beautiful being here now just just for this short amount of time as as order is absolutely astounding and i think when you take that in relation to his his biography and you know that quote you mentioned to me last time of um the 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 bombing is burnt into every page of his writing Mm. for ser ethically there's an understanding that when you see things which are ordered and things which are working, that the, the the chances of that within this physical system are so slim that it that it that it ought to be preserved for the sake of its own order, for the mm. sake for the sake of the fact that we can preserve it, that we can retain mm. order within this chaos. Or maybe maybe I'm being a bit a bit soppy, or you know, so so <laughs> so I would just say that just to leave the universe to it. I don't know. Um, I think there's um, there's certainly a, a a sense in in his work that um, that we should not wantonly destroy order, uh, which of course as as a species we tend to and um, and yeah there's there's certainly an appreciation I think of the of the kind of beauty and uh, wonder of things and their and their incredible variety that's certainly there in his in his thinking there is it's harder to put a finger on 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 any way we would say where you could say okay and by virtue of this principle we should not do this or 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 not do that there are kind of there are indications in those directions there's certainly a kind of anti-violence running through his thinking and i think we did we discussed this um last time but whether that translates into a into a kind of preserve this order and it's not quite so clear i think we should uh, i think there is a link a sense for him in which we should find ways to combine um peacefully with things so that we don't wreck them uh, and um but that's not the same thing as saying we should go around trying to find things that we can preserve um, mm-hmm. I think you know, that would might be a, a different a different thing would that be seen sort of almost as the same act of sort of human centric troll and violent violent not not so much violence but you know the idea that we are above and beyond the uh, the Lucretian system which he outlines the idea that mm-hmm. right this is this is well this comes back to that yeah. idea of uh, the spitting in the salad bowl the idea of property the idea of yeah, Caught, calling off somewhere and saying this is our hu- little human bit. This is ours, and uh, en- en- entropy can't can't affect this now. Yes, it would be, I think, to to to, to assume a kind of exceptionalism, which um, which is it's not really a part of his thinking. Yeah, I think I'd agree with that. I think one thing that's difficult for me here is that you do, I don't want to sort of promote the idea from this this because this text, I think, if it was read solely, you wouldn't get a full picture of says natural philosophy and and his his moralistic thinking what, mm-hmm. do you within this text do you find any clear parts where where we can begin to understand says uh, thinking regarding nature and regarding um, morality um yeah I, for me yes and actually i think um i think the, the key idea that we could draw out of this text in relation to to the points you mentioned, is the idea of contract really, um, which of course is something he took up uh, in in the later book, the natural contract. Here it's described again in terms of the formation of order from conju- from conjunction and um, from the conjunction of atoms as they collide. So atoms crash around, turbulence begin to form vortices, uh, then um, atoms begin to combine and form settled states. Now, these uh, combinations he calls contracts, okay? um, again, following 
following more or less uh, Lucretius. And um, the, the term in particular, which was taken from the Latin, is foedera natura, foedera natura, uh, a, which means essentially a natural contract, which then becomes the title of this later work. And um, the significant thing of this, about this notion of contract for him is that it's local and temporary. It's sort of, if you like, local in time and in space. And um, it's just a regularity that emerges and which then only becomes binding insofar as that regularity is repeated through that local configuration of, of order. But it's not binding in the sense that it that doesn't have any ultimate necessity and it, and it won't last forever. It will gradually, gradually unravel. So you have the notion of contract, which is a kind of peaceful contract. It's an alliance. It's a contract of love, to go back to that, that term for him. Uh, so that when you then come to the later work on the natural contract and he's thinking about the idea that uh, the, the, the political structure or figure of the social contract as, a, as the foundation of society is premised on the exclusion of nature as, as human beings leave the state of nature in order to form a social contract. Uh, and his argument is that we're, we're coming to, the, to a time when he was writing the book, he thought we were coming to the time. I think we can clearly see that we're, we're very much there now where we have to um, uh, rethink that exclusion of nature and to, to welcome nature into that contract to make it a kind of three-way contract, not just a two-way contract. Uh, the temptation when thinking about that notion of contract in that context of the natural contracts as a rewriting of the social contract is to think of it in kind of legalistic terms, is to, is to think of it in, in, uh, as, a, as a document, as a, as a formal agreement. But actually the term comes, he'd already explored the use of this term in the birth of physics and in, in Lucretius's text, where it just means conjunction and, and the emergence of order locally through forms of kind of combinations and settled alliances, if you like, regularity beginning to emerge. And that way of thinking from Lucretius can be read through into the notion of the social contract, if you like, so that you, you can then begin to think about our relationship with, with the natural world. Uh, through that notion of, a, of of contract as it's described in the in the birth of physics and let that kind of inflect the notion of contract that we might um, otherwise kind of begin with if we just uh, think about this think about the natural contract as a, as a kind of extension of the social contract you know so there's ways to i think there are ways in which you can draw out from this book um an awful lot of different things, including that question of, uh, of our relationship to nature. And would, would you say that he uh, he's arguing that we're thinking about nature in the in, in an incorrect way then within this book that that this form of contract shouldn't be um, take its shouldn't take its trajectory purely from the human, but nature is inclusive of the entire system that he's outlining here. Uh, I I think yes, if I understand you in your question, in the sense that uh, again it goes back to the fact that we're um, it's we're not we're not exceptional and and it's we shouldn't take a particular way of thinking that that we have and that we've developed and then assume that it should apply universally okay. uh, instead we uh, might take the way that we think about certain kinds of things uh, and then explore their kind of federation with other ways of thinking their connections with other ways of thinking without assuming that there's going to be a, a, a simple universalization going on here so um and i think uh bill was talking about communication and to pick up that theme we communicate uh, but our communication is only a particular instance of the communication of all things everything that's one of the points that sarah makes repeatedly all things uh, receive energy and information, store it and emit it. That's just some sort of, that's a kind of common, that is something like a kind of fundamental principle for him, I suppose. Um, 
And uh, our communication is just one particular variety of this. And so our way of thinking about contracts, for example, would only be one particular way of doing this, and there will be others. And no one is necessarily privileged over any other. And the best thing we can do is probably to extend our way of thinking by uh, kind of welcoming in, if that's the right way of thinking of it, uh, different ways of approaching ideas, because we will see similar instances, not the same, repeated in other in other contexts and other in other forms of order, and um, we enrich ourselves and our own possibilities and our own ways of thinking and our own ways of acting and doing uh, if we kind of allow ourselves to be allow our own way of thinking to be to become one simple variation among others and not to assume a kind of uh, a uniqueness uh, to it um yeah there we go do you think this way of non-privileged thinking then was um if i understand it this book was this might be incorrect but it was published in 1977 originally that's right yeah yeah, yeah. do you think that this non-privileged way of thinking was at odds with any any of the other um philosophical work going on around Sarah at the time? Do you think that he was potentially seeing stuff that came briefly before birth physics and thinking, well, hang on, we need to we need to step away? I mean, I don't want to bring Deleuze back into it, but Deleuze privileges production to a certain extent, and I guess you could say that, uh, you know, Lyotard privileges uh, in the middle of the economy, there's certain privileges there. Do you think that Sarah, yes. any of this was um, a form of, not reaction, but a, a, like a conversation, a dialogue with other texts? Mm -hmm. Um, to some extent, yeah, I'm sure. I mean, it's it's hard to identify any uh, clear cut kind of um, engagements with other texts here, but uh, to some extent, yes, I think Sayer had already decided that he his path was leading somewhere else. He was he, had, he was already off on a, on, a, on a different route, I think, and that. Had, Perhaps become clear already. Working through the the uh, the Hermes volumes, the, the the Birth of Physics was published in 1977 in French, as you, as you say, uh, which is the uh, just just at the very close, the same year as it was published, uh, the the final Hermes volume, and um, so it it kind of it's and he had already, I think, through that series elaborated a way of thinking and, and a set of problems which was uh, distinct from what was going on around him and uh, he's he doesn't it's rare to find actual direct engagements with with other philosophers or, or and it's rarer still to find anything polemical he does lose his temper with certain people and certain things just occasionally uh, uh, but it's usually like Socrates, for example, he has a series of rants at different places uh, against Socrates. So, yes, I think so. But and and I think you've talked already with with, with Bill, I think, and also with Massimiliano last week about this shift from thinking about production to thinking in terms of of communication uh, as ultimately a kind of more generalized way of thinking. That uh, production would be kind of one form of communication, and there's no, in the end, no reason to privilege that form of communication over other forms of communication. And so, it's a way then of thinking about well, how can one open up thinking to this more? Um, if I say generalized, I don't mean that you want to arrive at some general model, which then you can apply everywhere and say all instances of communication are simply this, but generalized in the sense that there are you identify variations and and you discover that production for example is just one of those and there are others uh, so i think he was already on the path to doing that and but he doesn't really um engage in any direct uh polemics against people there are a few remarks again uh, about bachelor in the in the hermes volumes it's true but um and bergson usually quite complimentary about bergson um but not too many. As as you've mentioned it, and I'm you know I'm not sure the opportunity will come up again. What was says uh, problem with uh, Socrates? 
Oh, um, well, he kind of there are there are kind of things he he, he likes about Socrates, but um, there's um, I'm sure you remember it. There's a uh, there's a long uh, there's a long rant directed against Socrates in the Five Senses, which uh, where he say is either genuinely or or at least feigns to be exasperated at, um, at Socrates's inability to shut up uh, and the, he's just been talking the whole time and um, for him there uh, it's about the um, about the centrality of language and about the fact that uh, our communicate. The problem for Sayre is that Socrates sp speaks too much and in speaking too much loses uh, or, or obscures uh, contact with the sensible world around him. In the end, and you can put it in the other, put it another way around if you like and actually say that what, what Socrates represents is the um, is a, uh, a turn away from the the pre-Socratic philosophers who are engaged with the natural world and thinking it, thinking about it, uh, towards uh, a complete focus on the human, on the human alone. And uh, that would be a kind of retrograde step or a kind of false step in a certain way for, 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 for Sarah, because we, in the end, we think best about ourselves if we think about ourselves in communication with the uh, sensible world, the natural world around us. With with that connection, um, the the you know our connection to the sensible world, and this is sort of an extremely. I'm just going to say, you know, from 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 my, I think it's a lame question, but I'm going to ask it because I think for a lot, <laughs> for a lot of people, it might be the one that they are they're wondering how Sarah counters it, which is yeah. if we're beginning with this um, random system, which you know there's no such thing as an origin. It, the Lucretian mm. system is sort of like a non-system. In what way does Sir, uh, if he does, um, address any notions of fate or determinism? You know, the idea that well, if it's all random, sort of why why bother? Perhaps you know, it's a bit of a lame question. Does he answer this with the non his his form of time again, the non linear, non linear form of time, or is there a, a different way he sort of addresses that problem? Yeah, no, it's a good question, um, and it's certainly an important one. The um, first thing I'd say is that it would. That, that kind of fatalism only really holds if we operate with universal laws, which which, which hold of necessity. But that's um, that's not the that's not the case for Sayer. And um, in the context of this book and reading Lucretius, it's not the case because laws don't emerge, as I said before, until after the um, the formation of order after atoms have combined in certain kind of ways and formed patterns of regularity and that those patterns of regularity give you the laws okay so let's imagine we're caught up in a in a system a bit like that and there are patterns of regularity and they seem to be pretty consistent and so here we are you know what, what can we do what can we do about it um first of all there is always the clinaman which will it doesn't happen only once it's it can divert atoms uh, from their path and that will uh, interrupt the the order it'll be to use uh, the example that uh, the theme that you were talking about with massimiliano will introduce that little bit of noise into the communication which will will um, spark off something different um, and uh, there's also the simple sense that we know no system is completely closed. So it's, uh, every system is open to kind of interference from from elsewhere in, uh, as well. And that's one of the reasons why for him it's important to think uh, and ultimately to, to, to live in ways that don't uh, involve kind of placing a fence around yourself and saying okay this is my this is my precincts this is it this is how we do it here this is this is my world this is my intellectual world or physical world and um, i'm going to live entirely within these boundaries um it, we're better off uh 
uh, being more adventurous and straying beyond boundaries sometimes. And um, he's very clear about this in some texts is that actually that that, that, that requires a certain courage. Uh, it requires a certain sense of adventure. But it is only by doing that that we can, um, we can, I was going to say survive. Well, we will survive if we just stay within within our own little boundaries and never go out. But um, but it turns into a first of all a, a, a rather dull life, um, and secondly, a life which in the end is, is probably foreshortened because uh, that system will just gradually run down and and uh, expire. Uh, whereas if we stray beyond the boundaries, if we welcome that kind of communication from outside, then um, the possibility of something new emerges and so we can which we can then engage with and uh and and, and um combine with in certain ways and which will then kind of enrich the the uh, the form of order that is who we are and in which we live so there's sort of a relatively dark physics-based vitalism per se can you just explain what you mean by um, so so the idea the idea of allowing uh so you were saying about you know uh, Allowing difference in, allowing uh, innovation, newness, and not not cordoning cordoning one off. Um, yeah. Perhaps my my definition of vital is a bit wrong, but you know the idea of targeting oneself towards life as opposed to forms of constraint. Then, in a sense, yes. I mean, the only one of the questions would first question. One of the questions would be uh, uh, what is involved in calling it vitalism. I mean, he is uh, he. There is a certain, and again, this might be something that. Uh, then it goes back to to other philosophers, in particular pe people like uh, like 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 Deleuze, perhaps. But the there's there is a uh, concern with uh, with life uh, and what we can say about life. He in later texts he is very clear that actually it's a mistake to try and define life, okay? Uh, because life, if anything, is def if it can be defined at all, life is defined by its capacity to break the rules and to be, to to change, to become other, and to not be what it's supposed to be or conduct itself as it's supposed to conduct itself. And if there's any definition of life, it would be it would be that, and that, which obviously then makes any attempt to define it in a particular way um, kind of problematic. So. Um, he wouldn't want to align himself with any particular kind of version of formulation of vitalism, but there is there is certainly a concern with life and what it what it takes to be alive and what that means and how life sustains itself. Yes, yeah. <laughs> I took I, I think my meaning my my definitions are probably uh, all over the shot there. No, no, no. I think it's a, it's a good question. I was I've been deliberately careful and trying to try to. Um, respond to that without without being too um boxing sarah in yeah exactly yeah <laughs> um so we've got coming up to about an hour here is there anything key for this text in particular that you think needs mentioning in you know obviously this is a, a silly thing to say again but needs mentioning in how how we can begin to understand sarah because beginning to understand sarah as as you've stated before uh, oh. can't happen from yeah. one book of his no there is no there's no way, but in terms of his thought, is there anything in this book that is, you know, particular to this text? Uh, I just mentioned a couple of things, which they're probably not particular to this text, because as we've already discussed, uh, the, the these these ideas and themes kind of run through uh, many of his many of his texts. Um, it's re you don't really find one book which is just about this and one book which is just about that. They kind of all of his books are kind of about everything, which is what makes them so fascinating, but also kind of perplexing sometimes. Uh, just a couple of things. First of all, thinking about the idea of equilibrium and disequilibrium. Dis this is, I think, is a really important idea in this in this text. That uh, order forms, as we've talked about already, but that uh, for him. Order is always is never a, never static. We're talking about dynamic forms here, um, and he he uses the term homeoresis uh, as as a as a, a way to describe a kind of quasi-stable dynamic uh, 
condition. Right. And um, there's a couple of things about that. First of all, first of all, he says, this is going. This is going back to his Leibniz, um, his Leibniz influence as well. His Leibnizianism is that there's that there is nothing, no existence without some kind of disequilibrium, without some kind of something falling out of balance. And he kind of articulates this uh, in relation to the kind of principle of sufficient reason in, um, in, in Leibniz and identity of indiscernibles and so on, is that if, if everything is perfectly balanced, there is no reason. It's only when things tip slightly that that you get some form of, of difference and some form of, of, of uh, between one thing and another, which then allows you to start speaking about the difference of this and that and how things are related and so on and so on. You, if there is absolutely perfect, harmonious, uniform order everywhere and balance, there isn't anything. There's no there's no world for us at all. There's nothing. So. Things exist in disequilibrium and can only exist in disequilibrium for, for, for say, things must be a bit out of tilt uh, to happen or exist at all. Then what do we find? Well, uh, we, um, he talks then about ways in which life, but um, systems generally, it's not necessarily a feature which, you, which is restricted entirely to something that we recognize usually as, as a living living form, uh, tries to compensate for the disequilibrium. And, and in doing so, there's a kind of reversal of some kind and a kind of attempt to to to, to rock back as the, the patterns which she talks about um, from Archimedes is something we didn't really discuss at the beginning. The, the, the text as he sees it is this kind of strange combination of the poetic verse of Lucretius and the mathematics of Archimedes which provides a kind of rigorous mathematical um, language in which to describe what Lucretius describes in verse. And one of the things that Archimedes talks about is the way that, that, that uh, a floating body rocks backwards and forwards. And this is a perfect kind of image, really, of, of, for, for Serre. The, um, the, the rocking movement backwards and forwards is like it's trying to maintain an equilibrium, but it never simply holds a fixed position. It's always rocking backwards and forwards in dis disequilibrium. And that's it's a kind of stable disequilibrium, and that's that's how he thinks. That's what he thinks we are. That's how he thinks that we exist, and that all kinds of things exist is, is through this in this kind of condition of stable disequilibrium. But um, but it's it, it, it if you want to describe it this way, you can describe it as a as a kind of spiral because it never comes back entirely to its uh, to its uh, point of um, point of. Of origin, uh, I can re just read another passage from the text where he talks about this. Actually, he writes that um, production only restores insufficiency. The labour, agriculture, navigation, and the arts compensate for the effect of degradation, but accentuate its impact. Th that decline requires a dynamic adaptation, but the the latter reinforces the decline spiral in three times. The reversible time of isonomy, the irreversible time of drift, the productive time of compensation. And um, to live from death to die to life, labor of life, labor of death, life of desire, desire for death. He says it, it finishes the passage. The, and what that does is identify three time, three forms of time, in effect, a time uh, of, uh, of um which is simply a time of repetition, a time which is always the same, cyclical time, if you like. Um, then the, the irreversible time, kind of entropic time, a time of decay and decline, which, which, which is in just carrying you towards, towards uh, dissolution. And uh, a time of compensation as he puts it here but she's also invention as he talks about it in other texts that we can we can uh actually add to the we can create order uh through our through our kind of engagement with with what is around us uh particularly to go back to something i was saying before if we venture out beyond our beyond our own little precinct and and, and uh, expose ourselves to, to communication from outside and deal with this and um, 
and incorporate it in certain ways and in, translate it, shall we say, into certain ways. And that, this is kind of invention, this is kind of compensation. So you have three patterns of time. They're kind of cyclical or, or you could also d- describe it, as he does, as, a, as a, the, the kind of reversible time of classical physics as well, where time almost doesn't exist because you can play the equations in both directions. Um, rev- uh, the reversible time, that is, I'm sorry, then the irreversible time of kind of decay, dissolution, and the time of invention. And that combination of three times is, is a really nice way of thinking about how he understands what's going on uh, in, in a kind of, in a material sense. But again, if we think of it, I could, we could say in a material sense, but only as long as we, we recognize that identifying it is strictly material is just one variation of other versions because it, it can happen also in ways in phenomena to do with with life or social world or whatever which where we don't have to describe it in purely strictly material terms because the uh, the elements we're speaking of in those contexts may may be may be different so that's one thing i would uh, i would say that uh, that sense of disequilibrium uh, and equilibrium and the how they play out together and how that story is also developed in terms of, of time there's a couple of things there i mean first, yeah. first firstly the the uh, the idea that Deleuze was stealing from Serre is becoming more and more pronounced to be honest i think um mm. this idea of three times and Deleuze three times three yeah. syntheses and the idea of the third synthesis being uh the, the, the sort of invasion of difference from the outside and the, uh, yeah. the eternal return spiraling off it's extremely close um so the question then for me would be is is there a way for say in which we can um perhaps it's once again from a human centered point of view but sort of convert time so if we're in that second time of uh, entropy um is there a way to convert entropy in, into innovation first of all to say it's that that kind of connections with Deleuze um yes uh to be to be fair, of course, the birth of physics was written in 19, um, or release was published in 1977. I've been thinking about these kinds of things for some time before then, but so it would take a little bit longer to trace these ideas back and see how it might connect up with some of Deleuze's work that was published earlier than that. But anyway, yes, that's, there are really important, interesting connections there. But your your question then was how to, sorry, <laughs> um, how, how, you know, if, if, if there is, if there is a possibility to move from the sort of entropic form of time yeah. uh, into a yeah. productive or not productive, uh, innovative. There's um, nothing I've found in his work which says, OK, here's, here's the manual. Here's, here's how to do it, okay. folks. OK. But there are which. But then again, that that would be completely contrary to the kind of. Uh, tenor of his work and how, how he how he thinks, but but there are uh, kind of examples and and variations, should we say, on on, on this, which he which he refers to. Um, there's uh, the idea which I've just spoken about, uh, referred to a couple of times, of, of stepping beyond the boundaries a little bit. So if we 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 can we exist very often in our own little world uh, where we where things make sense to us in certain ways, we have our own ways of doing things and um, uh, our own kind of habits and patterns of of thinking and life. And it's very important for him that we don't become too settled in those in those ways. That we continue to venture out as i was saying to expose ourselves in certain ways and to 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 try uh, to make it connect connections with other ways of experiencing thinking and and so on and that could be both uh learning a learning a new language i'm just, he doesn't refer to this specifically i'm just thinking um the learning a new language a new language or or reading in a new a new area of of uh of, uh, of analysis or scientific uh, work or whatever, so that we can take on some new ideas in certain ways and allow those, allow those ideas to to, uh, to to challenge us a little bit. Um, it could also be, of course, going back to an earlier theme. Um, it can be through through simply attending to things and to their to their formation and and trying to to read their history. Uh, in their own in their own terms and and, be, and being open in our senses and our 
to the physical world around us. That is immensely important for him too. I think he, he doesn't want us to get too wrapped up in in in, um, in language and in in particular scientific disciplines and discourses and so forth. Uh, they're important, but they're not everything. Um, so uh, how can we do this? Well, that's the first thing: is just to remain open, to listen to listen to different things, to attend to the world as as we experience it, um, and to to be ready to translate, if you like, uh, the importance of translating how we think into other ways of thinking, and the importance of translating other ways of thinking into our own. That is a really important thing for him. If there is one way of that you can put your finger on and go, okay, this is perhaps how to do it. That might that might be it. Okay, being being ready to translate in each direction from ourselves and our own habits and ways of doing things to others and um, and back into our own as well, so that we then find ourselves thinking, acting, speaking, engaging in certain kinds of um, you know, habitual behaviour, whether it's physical or mental, uh, in slightly different ways, and that's. That is that is new. That is invention, composition for him. He he talks about it. Um, there's a wonderful line. Uh, I think it's in. I'm trying to remember where it's from now. It might be in the Troubadour of Knowledge, where he uh, talks about work and the importance of work. And he can he says you can tell someone who works hard because they they get younger. Mm-hmm. These, these these things take work. They don't happen. They don't it doesn't happen by itself. It's going it to takes a lot of effort and application to. Uh, to to perform those kinds of translations, if that's the right way to think of it. Beautifully put. Um, if, unless there's anything else you'd like to add, um, uh, we can finish up. Unless there's anything you think we missed. With. Oh, there are bound to be loads of. Um, <laughs> uh, as as you said at the beginning, uh, everything you in each book you find almost everything. So um, I'm sure there's lots of, of things and um, that we could have spoken about and didn't. But uh, I guess we've spoken about that quite a lot. So uh, yeah, let's let's um, let's uh, let's hope that's enough for today. Yeah. Thanks, David. My pleasure. Thank you very much for for inviting us back and and uh, giving us a chance to talk uh, together um, about all this work and these ideas. It's uh, always a pleasure.